Okay. Um, so Lisa, of course, uh, arrived a few weeks ago. We start to time a little bit. Um, but she, this is actually her second time here. She was a um, CFA fellow uh, here back in the uh, early uh, part of the 2000s decade, um, uh, following her PhD at uh, ANU. And uh, she has won many prizes, uh, including the Anne John Cannon Prize, the Newton Lake Pierce Prize, uh, more recently the James Craig Watson Medal from the National Academy. And she became an international member of the National Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. After she left the CFA, she went to uh, she got a Hubble Fellowship and uh, went to the University of Hawaii and uh, joined their faculty, and then moved to uh, ANU as a faculty member. Um, and has now been here. So she has lots of different experiences uh, in, in various job applications, which she's going to be uh, sharing as part of this slide presentation. Um, you should feel free to ask questions um, during the presentation, but we are going to try to, to move questions toward, um, uh, you know, just try to pull some of the questions toward the end. So let's try to move through the presentation at, um, at some reasonable pace. Um, after the presentation, we'll have some period of full group uh, questions answered. We are recording this and we'll record that period. After we're done with that, and I'm hoping around 155, we'll break up into small group sessions. Um, we're pairing up uh, with, with some of the senior members here um, and also online. And that part will not be recorded. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask more privately, I would uh, just wait for that, that period. And with that. Okay. So I just want to take go. One second, go to first. Um, it's, for some reason, you're not you're sharing your other screen. We could share. I mean, I don't see the screen share. Um, no, we see like your whole problem. So maybe this one. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay, so thanks everyone for coming and thank you in particular to the senior members of staff who are hopefully here to learn about getting faculty jobs, I think, especially Charles. And we have Erwin online also learning about how to get a faculty job, which is great. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to tell you this. So this is obviously a subjective talk about my own experiences in um, faculty job applications. And first I wanted to, let's see, because my screen actually doesn't show that at all. See if one can actually see. There we are. Okay, so I wanted to show you this. This is 2022 data. So for people who's, who call themselves astronomers in the US, this is where they work. So it's not that everybody is actually getting jobs in universities, it's 55% are getting jobs in universities, and then 30% are working in government agencies. So that includes um, you know, Smithsonian, but also then various NASA and um, you know, government labs as well, for example, Lawrence Livermore Labs. And then there's 10% working in private companies, and there's still astronomy in private companies, so things like um, Boeing um, and other you know, space type companies, and then other is 5%. And those will be astronomers working typically in education um, or outreach, planetariums, that type of thing. And so there's actually a wide range of, of job opportunities, and this doesn't include the opportunities outside astronomy, uh, which uh, often include industry and data science right now. So why should you listen to me? Uh, so I've had a lot of experience on the job market as a candidate. Um, so these, I applied for lots of jobs, like lots and lots of jobs, mm -hmm. right? So this isn't just, you know. Um, and so I had various postdoc offers. Some of them included interviews, but they all for sure included applications. And then um, I was on the faculty job market for tenure track positions in 2007. And then um, in 2011, um, that was more of a sort of targeted, targeted job offer. So these are the things that I've been offered. And then the orange is the ones that I've accepted. So I've done a lot of interviews and I've done a lot of applications as well. And I think once you've done enough of them, you sort of know, you know how to do more. Uh, so I'm going to tell you everything I know. Uh, so what do you need to get onto the shortlist? So first you've got to get on the shortlist um, to get into the interview stage. Once you are in the interview stage, it's entirely up to you. It, it's less so less much less about your record and more about you know how how you go during the interview. But you've got to get onto those shortlists to begin with. And so there's a, a number of things you need in your application. 
to get onto their shortlist. So you need the reference letters, you need the publication list, research statement, teaching statement. Often nowadays you need a diversity statement and then you need a CV as well. And so I'm going to talk about each of these. So first reference letters. So it really helps if your referees are active and well known in the field and highly respected in your field. And so you should, as um, postdocs and as senior students, you should be working on cultivating potential referees who are active and well known in the field. And preferably they need to have worked with you, but I did use a referee that had not worked with me who I had known um, at conferences, but also from a visit to the same institution. And that referee actually wrote a good letter, I was told later by someone on the committee. And that, that was a good choice to have that person because they were very well known. Um, so it doesn't have to be someone who's worked with you, but they do need to know you and to be ideally citing your papers so that they actually, you know, they can say, yeah, we used uh, this person's work in our work and it was really useful and helpful or something like that. One referee should not be from your current institution. You don't want all your referees from the same institution you're at right now. Ideally, they're at multiple institutions. If you're applying for jobs in the US, uh, the more US reference writers you have, the better. But if you're applying for uh, jobs overseas, so for example, in Europe, it's really good to have at least one European reference writer on your list. And this is just, you know, this is just part of, of what's needed in order to get on shortlist. People tend to shortlist people where they know the reference writers. So pick a broad range of reference writers. And if you're going outside the country or you would want to have someone from that country because they're more likely to be more known to the people that you're applying to at those locations. They do have to be able to write that you're one of the best potential faculty members that they've seen. And so I'm going to tell you what you need to do to be able to allow them to do that. Now, you can actually find out whether they're going to write that for you or not. Okay, so you could say to them, I'm going to be applying for these jobs. And this applies for fellowships as well as faculty jobs or any post opposition, really. You can say, will you be able to write me a strong reference letter? If you're too busy, don't worry, I can ask someone else. And so they will say either yes and or they can say, sorry, I'm too busy. And if they say they're too busy, it may well be that they are just too busy <laughs> or that they're writing letters for someone else already that they know more, which often people don't like to write letters for two people for the same jobs. Um, that's not really fair. And the, the letters are often um, looked at side by side by the committee. And so your writers will know that and they tend, tend to choose the person they know better. So it's, it's often nothing personal if they say, no, they're too busy. But you give them the option so that they have an easy out if they can't write a strong letter because they don't know you well enough, for example. Okay, oh, did I go backwards? I think it's having trouble with the getting rid of the C. Okay. All right. So they have to be, act it's best if they're active in the field. So if you all would all know this, you've got to look at people up on ADS. <laughs> check out your reference writers as well. So you obviously check out yourself on ADS. You need to also check out the <laughs> reference writers. Now you should be aware, of course, that citations depend on field. Some fields people cite each other like crazy. <laughs> Galaxy evolution is one of them. And other fields don't cite each other so much and they're at all a small field. And so the citations overall for the field are lower, but you can still compare people within the same field. Um, other things affect citations. So for example, leading large programs, management roles affect uh, publications and citations, building instruments affects publications and citations. Someone may be very well known and doing these things, but they won't have, you know, the publication record or the citation record, and that's okay, and people are aware of that. Okay, so who do you need to get to write? reference letters. So that means who do you need to keep impressing through your career? <laughs> Usually your PhD supervisor, your poor PhD supervisor is going to have to write for you for the whole rest of their career. <laughs> and uh, so it's best to stay in touch with them because often what you see on these um, faculty 
research committees is that they'll read the reference letter and will say, this person did a really great job of their PhD work, um, but I'm not really familiar with their latest work and I'll leave that up to the other writers. Less good than a letter that says this person's doing, did a great job in their PhD and now they're built on this and are doing this and then they're doing that and then they're doing this and now they're doing that. Okay, so that's a much stronger letter. And so keep in touch, send emails. I used to call my, my former supervisor every couple of months, um, just on the phone and just tell him what I was doing and he'd tell me what he was doing as well. And people like it when you keep in touch with them. Uh, you should have one collaborator, ideally someone from your current institution. It does look strange if you don't have anybody writing from your current institution. Um, and a committee might then go and ask someone, anybody from the current institution anyway, to fill that gap. So you should, it'd be better if you pick someone. Um, it's ideally someone who's either a supervisor or a collaborator, someone who works closely with you. Um, doesn't have to be though, as long as you've impressed them. Sometimes if the person is like a director or a department chair and they know you and you've been contributing to the department, that can be an equally good letter. Um, and collaborator two is preferably outside both those institutions. So outside your current institution and outside your PhD institution. So ideally someone you've been collaborating with as well. That shows that you have, um, you can develop new collaborations and that you have connections. So writing good reference letters takes a lot of time and effort. So it takes a lot of time and effort to write bad ones and good ones. <laughs> and the ones that are in the middle take less time. <laughs> so you want to actually really impress them so that they'll spend the time to write the really good reference letters. And so how, how, how do you do that? So there's lots of ways that you can impress people. You need to do lots of consistently good work. Don't bother them with minor things. Okay, um, interact with them on a regular basis. If they haven't chosen to set up meetings with you on a regular basis, you do it. Take the initiative. Bring lots of results to all of those meetings. Uh, don't miss meetings. Don't miss deadlines. Turn up to meetings ideally in person if you can. Give them excellent first drafts of papers. Okay, so I can't tell you the number of times I've had to send a paper back because it is... You know, there are so many things wrong with it that it would take a day just to, just to, you know, try to solve everything, including spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes. You shouldn't be giving papers like that to your supervisor who then has to write you a reference letter. You should be reading other people's papers and using them as a model for how to write papers. Okay, so you know what a good paper looks like because you read them every day. They're out on the, the archive. <laughs> You should be writing papers that look exactly like those papers. They have to be grammar checked, spelling checked. It has to have followed a similar format. If you look at an introduction in a paper, they follow a very similar style. Each paragraph says something different in, the, in a certain order. Same with discussions, same with conclusions. You should be writing exactly like that. Don't use colloquial language in papers. We have professional language that we use in papers. Look at other papers to find out what the professional language is. Do you have a question, Charles? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so give them really good drafts of the first papers and they'll be impressed with you in comparison with all the other papers they get i guarantee that um learn from them so if they say they make a suggestion so you know why don't you try this go do it and don't make them ask you to do the same thing next the next time if they'll say they might ask you yeah, okay, so did you look into that? And you say no, or I haven't done that yet. Not so great. You need to have done it. Um, and the final thing is it's best to act. If you want a faculty job, act like a faculty member. Okay, so, um, you know, basically make it to the you know, what's the What's the phrase? Is it a phrase? You know, you're meant to act in the role until you get the job. Yeah. So join the faculty level committees, um, be visible, organize events, organize seminars, uh, seminar series or colloquia, uh, be involved in your department like a faculty member would. So I've only been here in this building a couple of weeks, right? And who do I know that I haven't actually really met properly in person? I've heard of Floor, because Floor sends lots of emails about this seminar series. Um, and you know, and I know various other, I know of, or I know various other people and what they're doing because they're sending the emails because they're organizing 
things, seminar series, community garden, that sort of thing, gets you name recognition in your department. And that's quite important uh, for when you're applying for jobs and someone has to write a letter for you because these things come to their mind as well. And you want your referees to write not just always about your science, they should be writing about how you will be as a faculty member. And that includes uh, things like contributing to the department and leadership. Uh, so, what's next? Dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Correct. <laughs> That's correct. Absolutely right. I used to be a goth as a student, and when I wanted to be a postdoc, I decided I'd have to dress a bit more, a bit less gothy. Um, example that you probably didn't know. Publication list. Okay. So, yeah, you remember me being a child. Oh, it raised well on me. So, what track record do I need? Well, uh, you can find that out. So whatever jobs you're looking for, you can look up their most recent hires. You can do an ADS search on those years. So you would know, let's say, the uh, job register and the uh, rumor mill says who got what jobs, and you know who got the jobs at the organization you're applying for and what year. So you can use ADS to actually find what their track record was in the year that they were applying. Okay, so the number of first order publications, citations, like index, whatever, you can compare yourself to the people that are applying that, you know, at the at the same level that they're applying for, for the jobs you want. And so you can just go and have a look. And this is actually really good for, for managing expectations as well. So, you know, it's important to be applying for jobs you'll be able to get and not waste your time on jobs that, you know, maybe they're looking for someone different. And so that's important. But some organizations haven't hired for a long time. And so, you know, by all means, just apply because you know, you never know um, with those. So research statement you have to provide. And so this is usually it's three to five pages and it's what research you've done. So I've seen a lot of these that focus just on research people have done and doesn't help people get on short lists. It has to be research you've done and then research you want to do while you're in the faculty role. And it and usually, you know, a really good one will have three to five years in detail, but also some things about what you want to do in the very long term. So maybe in the 10 year, a paragraph or two about that as well. And um, they they want to see a, a research vision. So they want to see what you're going to do when you're there. So should, tell them what you're going to do when you're there and how it builds on your previous research as well. And you know, what will make them hire you? And so you do have to connect to the organization because another thing we often see on committees is we see a research statement that doesn't mention anything about the department um, that the person's applying to, nothing at all. It's like a stock standard, um, you know, faculty research statement. And the problem is that if you've got that compared to some research statements that talk really about the department, who the person will collaborate with, who, uh, what telescopes and facilities of the department they're going to use, that one's going to get ranked more highly because it shows that the person's more serious about the role they've done the research and they've actually modified their statement for that particular institution. So do do your research. If you if you want a faculty job, you need to do the research into the, the organisations and departments that you're applying for. It's really, really well worth the time. So it's well worth the time spending a lot of time on this. I, I'm telling you, this is, this is very, very serious. So you need to know what the faculty work on. What's the range of topics? Um, how does your research connect with their research? Is it complementary to this person's research? Does it connect with that person's research? Will you collaborate with this other person? Um, what facilities and telescopes would you use? And if they've got future, are they building instruments for, for future, um, for other telescopes or for future facilities? If so, talk about those, how you would use those as well, if you can, right? And do they have a strategic plan that's available or a set of priorities? You can even ask if you have, you know, you can actually even email people and just say, do you have a strategic plan or you know, what are your priorities? And then you can put that in and just say, okay, my research fits in with this priority. And it's helpful. And the, the most important thing I think is to actually imagine yourself in the department. So once you've done the research, you have to imagine yourself there. Okay, you're there in this department, what would you do? With your time in that department and that's what should be in this statement and that's also how you will prepare for an interview and so the next thing is a teaching statement so almost all jobs 
uh, for a teaching statement. And this is very important, especially for teaching colleges. Okay, there are a really good teaching statement for teaching colleges. It's usually one to three pages, and you write more pages if there's more teaching at that particular university. And so what helps in that? So teaching experience does help. Um, you can get teaching experience in multiple ways. So quite a lot of people have experience already from grad school. That's okay. Uh, you can also teach uh, by being a, a TA or a, you know, a co-instructor or a co-lecturer in classes at your current organization. You would need to go have a chat with Dan. Um, but there's all, and there's also online astronomy um, and classes that you can also teach as well. So one thing that I did when I was a postdoc when I was CFA fairly here and then I continued through my hub or was that I taught online classes through Swinburne Astronomy Online. And so by the time I applied for faculty jobs, I actually had quite a few classes that I taught in the online environment. Um, they're looking for people who actually have innovation in teaching, usually, especially in, in uh, liberal arts and teaching colleges. And so if you've got an interest in or you've even done some innovative teaching styles, and that could be anything from you know, using technologies, using figures um, and, and surveys or think, pair, share um, type things you could be doing. If you're thinking about, have a look at flipped classrooms, um, just write about the sorts of things you'd want to do if you haven't done this already. But they are looking for something a little bit different usually. And have an idea about what classes you teach. So what's your expertise? What would you like to do? And how would you, how would you bring, for example, your own research into it? Um, if you use theoretical models, could you use them as part of a teaching tool? If you have telescope data, could you use that as part of a teaching tool? You know, so think about relating it to your own research. Okay, diversity statement. So this is about one to three pages, and sometimes I've seen two paragraphs. <laughs> uh, and it's your thoughts on diversity and what contributions you've made. And so what does help? And then so leadership is ideal, um, of contributions to idea committees, initiatives, department or organization-wide diversity um, committees or activities, leadership or contributions to education or outreach programs um, that, are, that are targeting you know, students from underrepresented minority groups or underprivileged communities. So that can actually make quite a strong um, case in a diversity statement as well. And successful mentoring of a diverse range of, and supervision of a diverse range of students. So if you have some of stu REU students, undergrad students, or your co-supervising students, you pop that in there as well. Um, what doesn't really work is I am supportive of diversity, just like a one state sentence or two sentences. Yeah, I believe in diversity. That doesn't cut it um, in these statements because there are people who can fill a whole page or three pages in this when, when organizations are asking for this. Um, but there's lots of things that can be included. So it's really important to actually step through everything on your CV and could it count, okay? Because there's lots of programs that you might be contributing to that actually benefit um, students from underrepresented minority, minority groups, for example. And finally, CV, so everybody's got a CV. And what can you do to boost your CV? Well, apply for grants, so that's number one because departments are always looking for people to bring in grants. I wish everybody would write more grant applications. Um, and a proven track record of bringing in grant income is, is often a criterion that they are gonna be giving a ranking or a score for when they're looking at applications. Telescope time and supercomputing time counts. Fellowships, application for fellowships and the monetary value of fellowships, if you're a fellow, that counts too as a grant. But pop, pop it in there as grant income. Um, and be on committees. So this is these look good when you're applying for faculty jobs because departments want people that have been contributing to their current department. They want people to, who are going to contribute to their department. They don't want people who are just going to sit in the office and shut the door and not interact with people. And having a proven track record that you're contributing is what they want to see. Um, and so, you know, try to make your organization or your division or your department a better place to be or your research group. That could be your organizer seminar series or journal club. Maybe you're arranging, you're organizing your group meetings. It might just be three people that you're organizing a group meeting of, but you're still doing something that's helping make your research group better. 
And then um, supervising students is really good as well for putting on your CV. So they, you will get questions in an interview about supervision. And so you need to have supervised students. Doesn't have to be PhD students, can be undergrad, masters, REU, you know, type students, and that's all right. Okay, so finally, um, you do need to give a cover letter. And I think the cover letter is actually quite important. Uh, a lot of people read the cover letter first. And it really sets it sets a person's mind when they're reading a cover letter first. If you write a good cover letter, they think, yeah, this is going to be a good application. And that's the sort of mindset you want when someone's reading your application. This is going to be a really good one. And so do spend time on that. It should be ideally is one page. Um, it can be a little bit over a page and up to one and a half, not longer. And then you, you need to have some paragraphs about yourself, uh, some paragraphs about the organization and why you're applying for the job how you will use their facilities, what you're going to bring to the department, and then what, you know, who you envisage collaborating with or supervise, co-supervising students with. So all that information that you've gathered from the department, put in the, in the cover letter. And do mention their facilities and telescopes and uh, partnerships and how you're going to use those because organizations spend a lot of money on their telescopes and their partnerships, and they want people to use them. And, you know, they're looking for faculty members who will. Okay, so let's say you've done all this great stuff and then you get on the shortlist and then you got an interview and you have to prepare for the interview. It's really, really important to prepare well for the interview. So this is where imagining yourself in the role is, is even more important. And that's what research would you do? What teaching would you do there? Who are you going to work with? What students, projects would you offer? What classes would you teach? That sort of thing. Now, there's a there's things that you're going to need to do during the job interview. So it's not just one interview where you have um, a panel and they ask you questions. It's usually a day or two full of activities. And so you'll have your job talk, which I could follow through. Um, a selection committee interview, usually an hour, sometimes a bit longer. There'll be one-on-one -on -one meetings with faculty members. And they could last all day or it could last two days. Um, you'll have meetings sometimes with postdocs and you'll have a meeting with students. You always will have a meeting with students. And then there'll be dinners and lunches. Someone or people will take you out to lunch and dinner. And it might be one night of dinner. It might be two nights of dinner, dinners. Uh, it may be one at something at someone's house. And then there'll be at sometimes, not always, but typically at, at teaching colleges, there is, you give a lecture, a class style lecture. And that might, that's likely to be to the whole department. Okay, so job tool. What do we need to do? So you should talk about your previous work and what you've done and definitely cite your papers because sometimes if, if someone's being very modest, they're not citing their papers, the search committee will then say, oh, I didn't really see any of their own work, you know, how much of their own and how much did they do really? And so you, you're trying, you're there to sell yourself promote yourself so do it uh, and then talk about what research you will do and you probably want to spend yeah about 50 50 doing both right? you have to talk about what you're going to do when you're there because there's so many of these job talks where it's just like a normal colloquium all about the person's past work and it doesn't give anybody a sense of what you're going to do or your vision and they usually get they will usually get input from the whole department not just the selection committee and the whole department, if they haven't seen what you're going to be doing in this talk, they're likely to say, oh, I don't really know what they're going to be doing when they're here. So do say what you'll be doing there um, and include their facilities, pictures of them help. And if they're involved in partnerships or future telescope, talk about how you're going to use those. Uh, and again, because they're putting a lot of money into it, they want people who use those things. And then if you're going to bring access to facilities, that they don't have, or let's say you're you're leading a GWST program and, and they don't have that really happening there, you can say, and I'm bringing my GWST program and I'll have lots of great student projects on it. And talk about your student projects in the talk. Um, that's good because the students are going to provide feedback into the selection committee. And so the students, and they do listen to the students. Um, so give credit also, this, this should be done in every single talk, but do remember to give credit to your students and collaborators for the work that you've presented. Okay, selection committee interview. So typical questions that you get, 
So these are, I've done so many of these and been on so many committees, uh, the faculty jobs, that this is a list of two pages of, of the types of questions you're gonna get. Icebreaker, describe your previous work. It's really to warm you up, um, what research you'll do, be excited. So you can prepare this as an answer, but don't prepare it so much that you're sounding scripted. You need to be excited when you're talking about your work and so that they feel the excitement too. There's usually going to be people that are outside your field. If it's at a physics department or a physics and astronomy department, there'll be physicists. Needs to be accessible to them. And so think about your audience when you prepare the answers to these questions. And leadership is often a question. We're looking for a leader. Tell us about your leadership in astronomy. So what they're looking for is a, a fairly broad answer sentence to begin with and then examples. Okay, so prepare that. What examples are you going to give to these questions and what broad answer will you give? Future plans. So they, they're definitely going to ask you what your five, three or five or 10 year plans are. We don't know which. So prepare answers for all of them. Um, and include re building a research group if that's something you want to do. What size? What grants will you get? Like how will you actually build your research group? Um, and, and what telescope? You know, are you going to apply for or supercomputing facilities will you apply for? And then connect to what they're already doing, talk about their telescopes and how you're going to use them. Um, you often get asked about your research group. What research group would you like to build? What size? How are you going to fund it? And so a tip for people who are applying for jobs in other countries, foreign countries, is find out what grant programs are available at the other countries because there's nothing worse than having this question in an interview and someone's come is from a different country and they say, I don't know, I'll have to look up, you know, what grant programs there are. You should be looking up these things, you know, European Research Council, Australian Research Council, and there's, there's foundations and it's very easy to Google those things. You'll be asked about supervision. What's your supervision style? Um, if one of your students is struggling, what would you do? There's usually a sort of an example type question there. Um, have you ever had any hurdles? How did you overcome them with supervision? Um, there's department specific questions. They want to know whether you're serious about the job. So they might say, why have you applied here? Um, or you know, what's attractive about our department? And then teaching, there'll usually be a question about teaching. So what's your experience with teaching? We'll describe your teaching style. Diversity, sometimes that's a question now. And so it's, it'll be something like describe your contributions to diversity or how do you feel about diversity. And then there's wild cards. So sometimes you get wild cards and sometimes you won't. Um, there's Sometimes you get things like what are your strengths and weaknesses? Um, so you've got to give them a weakness that's actually a strength. <laughs> um, like, for example, sometimes I work too hard or <laughs> I need to work on my work life out. I don't know. And it's really hard to answer that question right well. So have a think. It needs to be personal to you, though. So have a think about something that's a, a weak, that you would consider a weakness but is, could be perceived as a strength. Um, what do you most regret in your career? So this is a really, really hard one to answer. I've had it a couple of times. And... Um, you know, so sometimes you might think about the time and if you had time, what would you have also done? Um, things like that, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question that I got once was, if I gave you X dollars and it was a really large amount of money, what would you do with it? Right, that's great. Have a think about that. Or a large amount of telescope time on a particular telescope, usually their telescopes. What would you do with it? And so that's a question really looking for creativity. And then there's a wrap up question. So do you have any questions for us? So it looks bad if you don't have any questions for them. Um, some people actually write down what questions on the selection committee will write down what questions you have for them. And so, you know, you should, when you're doing research, uh, have some questions and it might be something like, you know, what are the broader opportunities within the university? Or you could mention something about strategic plan. I read your strategic plan. Um, you know, are you thinking about going in this other direction? Or, you know, something like that, something relevant. Okay, then the one-on-one -on -one meetings. So the one-on-one -on -one meetings I found really, really interesting. Um, so I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings. I, most of my job interviews were two days and I did seven. So there was 14 days of one-on-one of -on -one meetings. 
And so some faculty members will have a list of questions for you, sort of interview style, and most most will, will not. And they won't necessarily have anything to talk to you about. And so you can just sit there and they're expecting you to talk. So you need to be ready but with something to say for every faculty member. And so this is where it's all also important to be do your research so that you can have a productive conversation because they're looking for someone who'll fit in, who they'll they'll enjoy working with on the faculty. Often faculty ends up becoming a bit like a family. Um, there's lots of types of families, but they're looking <laughs> they're looking for you know someone who who ideally who would, for example, uh, vote with them in faculty votes for things. And so they're looking for someone with common ground. <laughs> it's true, it's, you know, it's true. So they're looking for someone with common ground. And so try to find common ground. Um, so do your research. Uh, what research are they doing? What papers have they just written? Ask them a question about the paper, even if it's not your field. If they're doing something that's related, think about possible student projects. Be a bit creative. Have a little bullet point of something you can talk about with everybody, and that really, really helps. You don't want to, have to be sitting there and having lots of silence in those meetings. They might be half an meetings. And then you'll have a meeting with the students, and this is normal, and they do count. And so sometimes the chair runs a meeting and it's like an interview, and then other times the students sit there, and you're all, you need to carry the conversation. So you do introductions. And then you can talk about your projects, student projects, what teaching you might do. They could ask you questions. I actually found that meeting with the students gave me a really, really good idea of whether the health of the department, whether it'd be a nice place to work. You can ask the students, are they happy? Gives you some very, they're very honest and they will tell you um, all sorts of things if you ask them if they're happy. And it gives, you know, you want to be in a place where there are happy students, really. Dinners and lunches, you have to be on the ball um, at these dinners. They're, they're looking for someone again who's going to fit in and they might focus on your science and more questions about your research. They might discuss department politics or university politics, which you might not be able to talk about at all. Uh, and they might talk about non-work activities and interests. And so if you can, try to uh, have common ground. So this did happen to me. <laughs> um, if someone mentions they like American Idol, and you watch American Idol, say so, really good. <laughs> you want to have some common ground. So class style lecture, um, just do something that you love and then try to add some innovation into it and practice, practice, practice. So that needs to be really good for liberal arts and teaching colleges. And there's a good link here to make your lecture more interactive. Not gonna um, dwell on this very much. Okay, so what else do I need to know? Uh, while interviewing, there is really exhausting. Two days, and if you're doing multiple of these over a you know four week period or something, it's really really exhausting. So you might be on um, for two days straight from nine a.m. to nine or ten p.m. So it's important to get sleep before you know, that starts, and to try to get enough sleep during the interview itself. Take it easy before the interview. Okay, maybe go do something else. So that you're refreshed and that you can be talking about all your activities, your work activities with energy. And try not to schedule your interview. You have a bit of a choice in dates. So try not to schedule them when you've got a deadline that week. Okay, so you can really focus on, on the interview itself. And then I can't emphasize enough being visible because um, sometimes as a faculty member, you do get a call from someone you know at a different university and they're saying, oh, so-and-so has applied for my job. What do you think about them? If I've not heard about them or I don't know them, I'll say, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know them. But if I can say, oh, yeah, that person's really active, you know, they've been organising our feast of facts or whatever it is, then that's good. And so that's why being visible helps. And um, I, think, I think that's all. So thanks very much. Ask me lots of questions.